This is a Rook Media Series, The Contemporary History of Iran, Part 12. Hi there, and welcome to the Contemporary History of Iran, a series from Rook Media. This is part 12, The Fall of Reza Shah. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Our aim with this series is to explore the events, personalities, and issues that have shaped modern Iran. We want to do this as much as possible through a non-traditional lens, through snapshots of change, and using alternative voices or angles. This series is mostly in English and will feature a new episode posted every Thursday across our Rook Media platforms. We will post subtitled excerpts with Farsi Zirnavis on our YouTube and Instagram sites. We are coming to you on rookmedia.com. It is there that you can link to all of our platforms, and we invite you to check out parts 1 through 11 of this series that are already posted. To become a sponsor or patron of Rook Media, please contact us through our website. The Contemporary History of Iran is brought to you in part by Yazdani Law Group. YLG is one of the largest Iranian-Canadian immigration law firms. Their mission, rooted in the leadership of founder Afshin Yazdani, is built on continuously striving to innovate and introduce new immigration pathways for their clients. Afshin began his career as a lawyer and law professor in Iran, and his company has now made it their goal to provide the best, simplest, least risky, and most inexpensive way to immigrate to Canada. YLG has an impressive track record, hundreds of applications from Iran successfully processed every year. They are at YLGPC on Instagram. That is Yazdani Law Group. All right, let's get started. Here now is the Contemporary History of Iran, Part 12. Well, as we discussed last week on this program, it's quite impossible to speak of the contemporary history of Iran without, at some point, spending some time focusing on the man who has been called the father of modern Iran, Reza Shah Pahlavi. Indeed, Reza Shah's evolution from military leader to prime minister to king of Iran from 1925 to 1941 would see him presiding over a fundamental transformation of Iran and the centralization of the Iranian state. But as dramatic and remarkable as the rise of Reza Shah was, his ignominious fall from the throne was no less dramatic and shockingly expeditious. To discuss the abdication of Reza Shah and his final difficult years in exile, I'm once again joined by an internationally recognized expert on this subject. Dr. Shal Bakhosh is an Iranian-American historian, author, and scholar. He is an expert in the history of the modern Middle East with an interest in the history of Iran. Dr. Bachosh has been the Clarence J. Robinson Professor of History Emeritus at George Mason University since 1985. He was a Guggenheim Fellow and has held fellowships at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and the National Humanities Center. He was born and raised in Iran, obtained his BA and MA from Harvard, and his doctorate from Oxford. Before beginning his academic career, Dr. Bakhosh was a journalist in Iran, where he wrote for the Kehan newspaper. Dr. Bakhosh has published numerous articles in prestigious journals and newspapers such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, the New Republic, the Times of London, the Financial Times, and The Economist, and he is the author of several books including The Politics of Oil and Revolution in Iran, Iran, Monarchy, Bureaucracy, and Reform under the Qajars, 1858 to 1896, and The Reign of the Ayatollahs. His latest book is The Fall of Reza Shah, The Abdication, Exile, and Death of Modern Iran's Founder. 
In part one of this two-part conversation last week, we talked about the rise of Reza Shah, his astounding record of transformation, modernization, and Persianization of Iran from 1925 to 1941, as well as his autocratic rule and iron will approach. Today, in part two, we will look at the fall of Reza Shah and his final years in exile. I'm once again joined by Dr. Shal Bachosh today from George Mason University in Virginia. Hello, sir. Hello, Jean. Very nice to have you back on the program. Thank you. Thank you. So in our last session, we talked at great length about the accomplishments of Reza Shah. In a very short time, in 16 years as king, he transformed the country of Iran. Would anyone have guessed at the beginning of 1941, including Reza Shah himself, that he would be abdicating later that same year? Uh, I'm sure he certainly would not have so guessed, nor was anyone aware that the abdication was coming. By the early 1940s, the Second World War is in full swing. Iran had remained neutral in the war. Why? Why was Reza Shah so resolute in not wanting to take a side in World War II? Well, he wanted Iran to remain neutral because he wanted to protect Iran from the ravages of the war and not to involve in the war. Besides, Iran had close trade relations with all the powers in the war, with Germany particularly, with Britain, and with the Soviet Union. And many uh, projects being carried out, particularly by Germany, were still underway, and he did not want to see those interrupted, uh, including the construction of a steel mill in Iran. Uh, all these reasons, and I think the experience of World War I, when, again, Iran was not involved, but was dragged into the war by foreign powers, he wanted to avoid that as well. Talk to us about the, the depth of the German presence in Iran by 1940. How deep was it? How, how much was uh, Germany inside Iran at this point? Oh, very deeply so. Germany was Iran's largest trading partner. It was uh, responsible for a number of industrial projects, some completed, some still underway. And Germany had helped set up Iran's modern banking system, its electrification. There were Germans in the railroad system and in communications. Uh, this German presence was a source of concern to the Allies, uh, Britain first and the Soviet Union next. I mean, they act on that concern by 1941, but I'm curious if you know before that time, say by 1940, how much of an issue was the German presence in Iran for the Allies? Uh, I don't think it was a security issue. I mean, clearly... Uh, Germany played uh, a role in the Iranian economy and had, as a result, influence in Iran. That may have been a source of resentment, but did not lead to security concerns as it did once the hostilities began. So in 1941, the, the, the British and Russians invade Iran. Uh, this is in August of 41. Before that, the British begin leaning on Reza Shah to take actions against Germany. Uh, and he does take actions against the Germans at the request of, of, the, of the British and the, the Russians. What, what do they ask and what does he do? Well, they wanted him um, basically to expel the Germans in Iran because they were concerned lest this large German presence in sensitive areas of the economy like the railways and the communication system, and particularly they were not involved in Iran's oil industry, the British were, but they were particularly concerned that Germans in Iran would uh, serve as agents for the Hitler's regime and sabotage the oil fields or the oil installations in the south. They continued to pressure Reza Shah to expel the Germans. Reza Shah did send some uh, Germans home, but he was reluctant, uh, in fact resisted 
uh, sending them all away as the British and the Russians demanded, in part because they were involved in industries and other projects, and uh, because, as he rightly argued, the uh, Germans would regard such an expulsion of their nationals as a hostile act and a violation of Iran's neutrality. He feared then the Germans would invade Iran. I wonder if we know anything about the personal predilections of of Reza Shah at this point. I mean, did he have any particular affinity for the British or the Germans or the Russians? It occurs to me that he spends the first half of his life, you know, with the Cossack Brigade, which is a Russian-led uh, and Russian-influenced uh, army. Did, did, does that mean he grew up pro-Russian? Do we know anything about that? No, I don't think so. But the British and the Russians had dominated Iran ever since the 19th century. They interfered in Iranian politics. And one of Reza Shah's uh, aims was to end this foreign domination of Iran. In fact, Germany came to be regarded as it were a third force and as a balance to these two great powers that neighbored Iran. I think, you know, Reza Shah admired Germany for its economic accomplishments and also for its kind of discipline and firm rule, that that sort of thing. Uh, And many Iranians in the uh, ruling elites uh, had that same admiration for Germany. But I think it's wrong to, as some have uh, asserted, uh, that Reza Shah was uh, pro-Nazi. I think Reza Shah knew very little about what was going on in Germany internally and the kind of regime that Hitler was running in his country. You you note in your book, and you just mentioned it a moment ago, that that the Iranian population by the uh, early 1940s was very largely pro-German. What what do you attribute this pro-German sentiment to? Partly the result of the anti-British, anti-Russian sentiment. Uh, Also, the politically aware Iranians saw Britain as a supporter of Reza Shah. They even believed, they came to believe that it was the British who brought him to power. Um, And uh, since Reza Shah had grown increasingly unpopular, and his rule resented inside the country, this association with England, and to a lesser extent with Russia, inclined many Iranians towards Germany. Meaning that, um, uh, not that I want to indict the Iranians of mid 20th century for, you know, but I mean, meaning that they were, were actually on the side of Germany in the war, they're thinking they're, they're pro-Hitler? I imagine somewhere, and at least according to British reporting, many officers in the army were also pro-German. But as I say, this was less due to a knowledge of the character of the regime that Hitler had established in Germany as uh, seeing Germany as a counterweight to the Uh, great powers, and admiration for Germany's um, economic uh, accomplishments and its discipline. So uh, the the big event that leads to a series of other events that include the end of uh, Reza Shah's reign is the invasion of Iran by uh, Britain and the Russians in August of 1941. Why did the British and Russians invade Iran in August of 1941? Well, the publicly stated reason was the large German presence, the danger this German presence posed to allied interests and the... uh, Uh, refusal of Reza Shah to expel the Germans. But I think the critical reason was that once Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, getting aid 
to uh, Russia and its hard-pressed army was crucial to the war effort. And for this, the Allies needed access to uh, Iran's overland routes from the Persian Gulf to the Soviet Union. The use of Iran's railways and roads to supply Russia would have been incompatible with Iranian neutrality, and so the Allies invaded. Does the invasion take Reza Shah by surprise? I'm sure it did. Uh, I think by by now, he not only had become, I mean, as a part of the autocratic dictatorial tendencies he had adopted, he uh, really was not as aware as he had been early in his reign of what was going on in the world. He had isolated himself. And uh, I don't know to what extent his ministers realized that an invasion was imminent, but they certainly were fearful. They'd be too of, scared to tell him. <laughs> of telling him the truth, yeah. You repeatedly, there's correspondence in your book, which, which is quite remarkable. You have these letters uh, that repeatedly show that the British were quite convinced that Reza Shah was deeply unpopular by this point with the Iranian people and that this would be a liability for the British. Do we know that he was this unpopular? And I don't really think we know it as it were in a provable way, but by anecdotally, yes. Uh, but I, it's possible that uh, Sir Rita Bullard, the British ambassador, and his very influential press secretary, Nancy Lambton, exaggerated. I mean, I don't mean they invented, but they had an exaggerated sense of how unpopular Reza Shah was. A, a very, I mean, Bullard had himself, the British ambassador, had himself grown increasingly disenchanted with Reza Shah, and his dispatches to London are increasingly critical, both of Reza Shah and his rule, but also sensitive to the British association with Reza Shah in the Iranian mind. And he was greatly influenced by a report that Nancy Lambton, his press attaché, uh, drew up along these lines. Lambton knew Persian very well. She traveled around the country a great deal. She did talk to people at, of all classes and different levels of society. And in her memorandum, she argued that Reza Shah was vastly unpopular with the majority of the population, that in the Iranian mind, Reza Shah remained in power only due to British support, and that Britain was unpopular in Iran due to this association with Reza Shah. Of course, the British were unpopular in Iran for a large number of reasons. Right. Not only this one, but in any case, that is the argument that the Ambassador Bullard made in his dispatches to London and even began to suggest on the eve of the uh, Allied invasion of Iran in August of 1941. And later, when the invasion and occupation has taken place, that it was necessary not only to distance, for Britain to distance itself from Reza Shah, but actually for to replace him right. on the throne. Although, although, although I should note that, uh, that you note that Ambassador Bullard, uh, this British minister to Iran, uh, he's quite capricious, it seems, because by in early 1941, I mean, you say he's increasingly disenchanted, but but there's dispatches from early 1941 where he's endorsing and supporting Reza Shah, and then by midway through that year, he's calling for his effective removal, right? Yes, I mean, when he first is uh, appointed uh, minister, major ambassador to Iran, he sees it as his primary responsibility to win over Reza Shah's friendship 
for Britain, and he went out of his way in the first year, in his first year in Iran, to accommodate the Shah in uh, what he wanted and needed in terms of of trade and supplies to Iran and exemptions for Iran on the restrictions on trade that Britain had placed, particularly with uh, Germany. But he grows disenchanted with Reza Shah and uh, turns against him. And as I say, begins to suggest to his government that not only that they should distance themselves from Reza Shah, but eventually also to seek his expulsion. Right. So there's a couple of reasons that you outlined for why they're seeking his expulsion by uh, mid-1941. One is the the question around popularity and his unpopularity in the eyes of the British. Uh, The second around um, this notion that he's not going to fully cooperate with the Allies if they do leave him in power. Let me take them one at a time. Would it have been conceivable that the British would not have ousted him had they believed he was very popular in the country? In other words, if if Reza Shah really was popular and still had all of his ministers and, and you know, had the, had the support of the population, would it have been possible that the British would not have followed this path? Well, it's obviously a very different um, equation if he had been popular. Uh, but had he been popular but insisted on maintaining Iran's neutrality in the war, I think they would have invaded anyway. Uh, Because once, uh, as I said, Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, access to Iran's overland routes became crucial to the war effort. And I think that was the main reason for the invasion to begin with. But... uh, But why were the British, why were the British so sure that Reza Shah would not work with the Allies or would obstruct full cooperation and that an abdication would be necessary. In other words, if they really drew the line with them and said, look, we're about to remove you, would he would he have cooperated? Well, they, they feared he'd, he'd not be fully cooperative with uh, Britain and the Soviet Union's needs in terms of access to Iran's railways, its ports, its uh, airfields and the like. Uh, Reza Shah also attempting to maintain a semblance of Iranian neutrality, continued to maintain diplomatic relations with some of Germany's allies, and being a, an autocrat and not liking foreign <laughs> interference. Uh, in Iran, they assumed that he would not fully cooperate with them and their presence in Iran. It's a bit sad, really, that some in the Iranian population would not appreciate or or like Reza Shah because of his association with the British, and yet what brings him down in the end is he's not associated with the British enough in the in the eyes of the British. <laughs> it's uh, he's yes. sort of getting it from all sides, isn't he? There's this outstanding part of your book, where I mean, outstanding in, in terms of a bit shocking, really, where you, uh, and I don't know if anybody had talked about this before you you do in this new book of yours, where you outlined that the, the, the British toyed with the idea of not allowing for the succession of the of, of the constitutional era, Mohammad Reza, at all, but toyed with the idea of getting rid of the Pahlavis altogether and bringing back a scion of the Qajar dynasty. How serious were they about this? Well, that's really a rather interesting story. Uh, the origin, nature, the originator of this idea of replacing the Pahlavis once again with the Qajars was Peter Avery, the uh, Secretary of State for India. Avery had got it to his head that a Qajar prince in exile in London with whom he had become a friend would be a much better king and friend to Britain than the Pahlavis. And initially when he began to press this idea to the foreign secretary, Anthony Eden, 
both Eden and the Foreign Office in general were very skeptical. But Amory persisted in pushing for a Qajar restoration. And because of the problems they were having with Reza Shah, and because of uh, Bullard's continued negative reporting on Reza Shah, they actually toyed with the idea for a brief period. Uh, I think what, oddly enough, what saved the day for um, the Pahlavis was no other than Sir Reader Bullard. Hmm. Bullard, despite his really dislike, I think is the only way to put it for Reza Shah, was uh, in a long dispatch um, explained why a change of regime uh, at that particular moment would not be a good idea. First of all, he said there was enough disorder due to the war and the invasion not to invite even more turbulence in Iran by a change in regime. Uh, Secondly, he believed the constitutional path, which is to allow succession by Reza Shah's eldest son, would be the best thing. And I think Bullard was much influenced by the foreign minister, the Iranian foreign minister and the Iranian foreign secretary, who persuaded him that uh, maintaining the Pahlavis on the throne would be uh, a much better course of action. Besides, there really was no support for the Qajars in Iran. They had become very unpopular and little respected in Iran by the end of of their reign. I think these factors together uh, led Eden finally, after toying with the idea of dynastic change, of yes, dynasty change to abandon it. By the way, that the Qajar prince in exile in, in London would be Ahmad Shah's son? Who, who was son, he? son, yes. Son, right, right. And, but but and, there, I mean, there really wasn't any other option than Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, was there? I mean, the, 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 there's nobody well, waiting in the wings. The British even toyed with the idea of, of one of his brothers, uh, I mean, it's really, it was, it's a, it, I, I uh, devote a chapter in the book to this rather strange episode yes. because it was so pie in the sky. It's very hard to understand how the British could even think of uh, such a thing, but they did uh, in the confusion of the times. Uh, there's also the fact that the Bullard was persuaded by the Iranian Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary that uh, Reza Shah's eldest son, the successor, uh, was young, was reform-minded, was well-meaning, and would rule well. I, that too was a factor. You know, just as a sidebar, it really is. <laughs> it really is sort of textbook twentieth-century. Uh, imperialism, isn't it? Like it, it's like uh, the British, <laughs> the British, you know, spinning a roulette wheel and going, okay, we want to get rid of this guy. Who are we going to put in his place? I mean, it's it it really is a, a fine example of of what happened all over the place. I guess throughout the the, the 20th. I century. quite agree. I mean, this whole idea that you could remove kings, change dynasties, was still part of the imperial mindset. By September 1941. Uh, the Allies, uh, the British, decide they need to invade and occupy Tehran. And it's in those days, in fact, September 16th of 1941, that Reza Shah gives up the throne. Now, I say gives up the throne. There is some historical disagreement about whether this was ultimately his decision or whether he was forced out. Where do you stand on that question, or is it even relevant? Oh, I think it was. it's very clear that he was forced out. You know, when the Allies occupied Iran, they did not initially enter the capital. Both the Russians and the British uh, avoided uh, entering Tehran itself or occupying it. The British Foreign Secretary, Antony Eden, knew with near certainty 
that Reza Shah would abdicate if they did occupy the capital. First of all, he was uh, perhaps too proud to rule over a country occupied, its capital occupied by foreign powers. Uh, secondly, he really feared the Russians and he feared the Russians uh, might arrest him. And you can see from the uh, British correspondence and archives, Eden was very well aware of this and manipulated things and worked with the Russian ambassador in London, Maisky, to bring the occupation um, around. There's an interesting little episode here. Uh, the British uh, and the Russians demanded the closure of the embassies of Germany's allies in Europe. Eden tells the Russian ambassador Maisky that if the Iranians don't comply by the deadline, we will occupy the capital. Right. And if they do so, then we shall find uh, have to find another reason for occupying the right, capital. Right, right. So by then he was quite set, Eden was, on forcing Reza Shah to abdicate. When you when you talk about Reza Shah being proud, a proud man, um, there's a little detail. I, I can't remember now if it's in the book or if if, if I've seen you talking about it, but. But where this is a man who, for almost all of his adult life, and certainly when he is the reigning Shah, is wearing his military outfit, is wearing his official garb. And from the moment he abdicates, he's forced from the throne, he refuses to wear that, and he wears sort of civilian clothing, which he sees as a as downgrade. Is that right? Can you speak to that? Yes, it's really a rather interesting thing that once he abdicates, he abandons the military form, he'd, uh, the military uniform he'd worn all his uh, adult life, as if he no longer deserved it. Uh, and he hated civilian clothes, mm. but he continued to wear them during his exile. You know, I should note that when we talk about the British agreeing to, to, to Mohammad Reza Shah becoming the, the new Shah, the son, uh, this decision is made, you note, um, the accession is allowed, but only on trial, quote unquote, and on the condition of, quote unquote, good behavior. Uh, which of course is as patronizing as it can get, but but how were they? How were the British defining this? Uh, I mean, was were they defining this as Mohammad Reza Shah having to agree to anything the British wanted, or what is what is good behavior considered? Well, I certainly think it was uh, close cooperation with the Allies during the war, and then being undertaking reforms as the prime minister and the foreign minister believed he would. Thirdly, I suppose if the war was over, continuing to be a good friend to Britain. Yes, and so it really is an interesting sideline to the British final agreement to allow Mohammad Reza Shah to succeed his father. How would that have been communicated to him, do you think? Was that something they told him in a back room, or is that written somewhere? Uh, or? Oh, oh, yes. I mean, Eden, in a cable to his ambassador in Tehran, Bullard makes this quite clear. These are his words. No, I know Eden says that, but how did they tell the Shah that, uh, Mohammad Reza Shah? I don't think they, they told him that, oh. they, they, but they must have told his ministers. Ah. Uh, now, whether they conveyed it to him, you must be a good boy. Uh, I, I really do not know, but they were aware of it. I have to say, you know, um, uh, Dr. Bahash, your, your this new book of yours, The Fall of Reza Shah, that the second half of it is, is focused on uh, Reza Shah's final years in exile. Uh, and it's, it's, it's quite a sad read. I mean, it's not, it, it, there's really nothing to celebrate about those final years. Um, but it's also a bit of a Rubik's Cube for the British. I mean, it seems like the British 
develop this very delicate problem with sending Reza Shah into exile because they could not have wanted an unhappy ex-king on their hands and the bad PR that would come with that when they're trying to maintain goodwill and cooperation with the new Shah in Tehran during the war effort. How hard was all of this to stick handle for the British? Well, it is, well, it is first of all, a rather uh, sad story of a once very powerful man, very independent man, now being in the hands of a foreign power, one of the powers he set out to free Iran from whose domination. Um, He was unhappy in exile. The British first took him to the island of Mauritius, which he hated, Uh, It was an island, it was small, it was surrounded by the sea, and he came from a village in the mountains and even said he yearned for the bracing air of a mountainous country. Mm. Secondly, well, his movements uh, were controlled by the British. The British decided whether he could uh, have visitors from Iran or whether members of his family who had accompanied him could leave uh, Mauritius and later uh, the second place of exile, Johannesburg. Uh, They uh, censored his mail and that of his family. So clearly that all didn't go over very well and was difficult. And the British, on the other hand, found uh, Reza Shah and his the members of his family demanding, difficult to please. So on both sides, it really was an unhappy relationship in these years of exile. By the time Reza Shah abdicates and he's in exile, uh, particularly in Mauritius, you describe him as a man who was broken. Can you tell us more about that? Well, his his family saw him a man uh, as a man who was broken. Uh, his daughter, one of his daughters, described him as stooped, his shoulders bent. Uh, he took very little joy in anything. Certainly on the island of Mauritius, um, in Mauritius, he refused to venture out of the home the British had chosen for him. He only left the house twice. Once when his son was involved in a minor automobile accident, and the second time to attend a dinner given by the governor of Mauritius uh, to mark the signing of the tripartite treaty between uh, Iran, Britain, and uh, the Soviet Union, when members of his family urged him to accompany them on an outing, he said no, that he was a prisoner and must behave like a prisoner. He's so unhappy in Mauritius that the the British are trying to find a, a place to send him, and they're getting denied by many countries around the world. Um, one of the options, it was interesting for me to to, to read this um, as an Iranian-Canadian, one of the options was Canada. Reza Shah may have come to Canada. Do we know if Canada gave the green light to Reza Shah to come? Uh, and wouldn't it be easier for the British to control him in a British-associated place like Canada rather than Johannesburg? Uh, well, the, the British had a lot of influence in Johannesburg too, but... Of course, it would have been easier, but it was a long trip from Mauritius to Canada. It meant getting the Canadian government's agreement. Uh, It would be obviously more difficult to supervise him in Canada. He wanted to go there. Uh, I mean, one of the reasons they uh, sought the Canadian government's agreement to play host to Reza Shah was because he wanted to go there. They thought he might be happier there, and the Canadian government did agree. But again, uh, as they were told, they should exercise 
as they called it, a discreet supervision over him, mm. over whom he received as visitors to censor his mail and so forth. You know, that's, uh, I often um, find that you, you learn the most about someone in the, in the little details again. Uh, and something that you describe really hit me where by the time Reza Shah, I mean, you know, this, this period in exile is not very long uh, until he dies, obviously. Uh, and by the time he gets to South Africa, uh, a year or two into the exile and in his final year of, of, of living, uh, he's quite frail. He's in the need of doctors and medicine, but he refuses help. He doesn't take ambulances, won't go to hospitals. Um, so, again, it's an interesting paradox. I mean, despite the fact that he's now, as you've described him, a broken man, he's still too proud to admit that he's in ill health, huh? Indeed, that's very striking. But even though he was sick, he developed heart trouble. Uh, he refused doctors or pay, to pay attention to doctors or to refuse and he refused medication to take medication he hated the idea when he arrived in johannesburg that they had an ambulance waiting waiting for him uh, so yes he remained a very proud man till the very end there's also it's intriguing um and difficult this um strange uh, dysfunctional relationship in the family um, and, and and with Reza Shah and Muhammad Reza Shah. I mean, first of all, I, I can't even get into the, how, what the mindset is of, you, you know, you, you supersede your father to become king and your father is exiled and I, the whole thing is strange. But then uh, Reza Shah is asking Muhammad Reza Shah for money, which he then sends uh, to, to Reza Shah, and um, Reza Shah is, 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 and the family are unhappy, but they're in relatively okay material conditions in Johannesburg. Can you describe those th those final months and what was happening there? I mean, the financial arrangements during his exile are interesting. Uh, the British took the view that since they had taken him into exile, they should be responsible for his household expenses. But anything personal, personal expenses should be paid by Reza Shah himself in the period in Mauritius. But they always somehow resented carrying this expense. And when Reza Shah pressed to leave Mauritius for somewhere else, they made clear that because he was changing his place of exile himself, if he left Mauritius, he'd be responsible for his own expenses. So uh, after he left Mauritius, uh, Reza Shah had to pay for his own ha household expenses, rent, and so forth himself. Now, his son in Tehran, Mohammad Reza Shah, uh, transferred money to him at regular intervals. So he was well supplied with money. But he always seemed to be worrying about not having enough and always pressing his son to send him more money. Uh, what do you make of that? Well, he perhaps, uh, having been by the end of his reign a very wealthy man and suddenly ending up with nothing, uh, made him feel concerned about money. And he, he did have a very large family before he left Iran when the British consul was pressing him to leave more quickly. Uh, one of his comments was, where am I to go with this hoard? I don't have a penny to my name. <laughs> so he felt this need to be well supplied with funds in part because of his very large family that had accompanied him. But it's also the case, as I describe in the book, that by the end of his reign, he, he was a very wealthy man. He had amassed a great deal of property all over Iran. He had very substantial bank accounts in Iran. 
again under British pressure, uh, his bank accounts and his properties under British pressure, he transferred all his wealth to his son, supposedly for use for the welfare of the country. So he really did leave Iran without a penny to his name and became dependent on his son to supply him with money. And Dr. Bahash, do we know anything about their relationship? Like you don't include any correspondence between them in the book or anything. I mean, what what do we know about what their relationship was by the end? No, I really don't think we know enough. I mean, there is uh, Reza Shah himself was very devoted to his son and always eager when travelers were allowed to come and visit him in Mauritius or Johannesburg for news of his son and what he was doing. He was extremely happy to receive the rare letter from his son and once even a recording of his son's voice. What Muhammad Reza Shah, the successor now on the throne, felt about his father, we don't know. But he certainly was sensitive to make sure his father was comfortable, Mm. that his wishes were met, and pressed the British on that. And as you happened to mention um, earlier, the need to, uh, the British need to have Muhammad Reza Shah's cooperation during the occupation uh, led them to try and meet. Uh, Reza Shah's wishes. By his final months, and this is 1944, I guess, in Johannesburg, uh, Reza Shah becomes increasingly reclusive. He's not seeing people. He doesn't really go out. He he seems like he had become a shadow of the powerful military leader and, and king that he once was. Um how can you describe what you, you've you learned about his final days? Well, as you say, he became increasingly reclusive. He hardly left his house. He hardly saw anyone uh, except his members of his immediate family. So, yes, he had become a shadow of his former self. And I think it was a very lonely last year for him in Johannesburg. Has anyone, uh, I mean, it's sort of delicate, obviously, but has anyone drawn the, uh, surely somebody has, the the comparison, the sort of um, macabre comparison between the final days of Reza Shah and then what happens in the final days of Muhammad Reza Shah? I mean, it's, it's... it's it's in a very difficult, sad way, quite reminiscent, isn't it? Quite resonant. It's, it's really very striking that, that both Pahlavi monarchs end up uh, losing the throne. In, in the case of Muhammad Reza Shah, the kingship itself for Iran, that both father and son uh, spent their last years in exile. Also, the fact that, you know, Reza Shah's remains were buried initially in Egypt Mm. during the war, Mm. before they were transferred to Iran after the war. And it's striking that Muhammad Reza Shah spent part of his last uh, months alive in exile in Egypt. In fact, he died there. Yes. So yes, these parallels between father and son and unhappy last year, in the case of Reza Shah, his unhappy last years, are very striking. It, it seems, I mean, if you believe in universal intervention, neither of them are are meant to be in exile. I mean, they neither of them last very long in exile. You know, they, it's just just it. Just, their their bodies give out. It's it's this is not where they're meant to be, and and. Uh, uh, it's um, yeah, it's striking. Re- reading the, uh, the 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 final days of Reza Shah, I I couldn't help but think about the Shah, about Muhammad. Yes, Reza rightly Shah. so. And just the sad, you know, the sad sort of lottery of a 
of an imperial power running around the world trying to find where to place them in exile and different countries rejecting them. And I mean, the whole thing is is so, like I say, macabre that it happens to father and son. You know, it's a uh, it's a, an, an epic saga. Um, this. Um, before I let you go, you know, reflecting on this and thinking about how uh, how quickly and how impressively Reza Shah um, comes to power in Iran and transforms a nation, um, it is striking how quickly he is ousted out of power. And the simplest analysis of the end of Reza Shah, of course, is that World War II happened. And it affected Iran. And in the end, despite Iran's public gestures of neutrality as much as any other country in the world, because it causes the abdication of a powerful ruling king, Iran is affected by this war. If World War II had not happened, if you'll forgive me for playing this game, what would the plight of Reza Shah be? His inner circle had dwindled. He was, by all accounts, no longer entirely beloved by the Iranian population. Yet it's hard to imagine he would have stepped down. I, I think of this because I think of what happens with Mohammad Reza Shah, who then becomes a very powerful king for many for a few decades. Um, this wouldn't have occurred if World War II hadn't occurred in the way it did. Can you make sense of all of that? Well, Reza Shah, I don't think there's any indication he would have been overthrown internally or he would have stepped down voluntarily. He would have finished his reign in Iran until his death. Uh, Mohammad Reza Shah, of course, was overthrown by a revolution, and he had to leave Iran, and the monarchy itself was abolished. So uh, alongside the similarities we noted between father and son in terms of losing their thrones, there are these differences as well. In releasing this book, in publishing this book, um, I'm sure you've had many conversations and different interviews and um, reactions to uh, the story of Reza Shah and his final years. What has perhaps surprised you or what can you note about what you've learned from the way people have reacted to this book? Well, we, as we m mentioned earlier, what is surprising is that uh, there is renewed admiration for Reza Shah and a renewed nostalgia for a leader who would be a secularizer who would be modern and who would be devoted to Iran's being part of the modern international community. Dr. Shal Bakhash, it has been a, uh, a great education and a, um, a great pleasure to get to do this over two parts. I can only thank you so much for the time and uh, for your efforts, and I hope to do it uh, again and in person at some point. Thank you. Let, let me add before you go that I really uh, admired how well you had mastered the period yourself uh, and how well you speak and what good questions you pose. That means a lot to me coming from you. It really, it really does. Thank you for saying that. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Dr. Shal Bakhosh, an Iranian-American historian, author, and scholar, and the Clarence J. Robinson Professor of History Emeritus at George Mason University. His latest book, which I recommend, is entitled The Fall of Reza Shah, The Abdication, Exile, and Death of Modern Iran's Founder. We reached Dr. Shal Bakhosh in Virginia today. This is full time for the Rook Media Series, The Contemporary History of Iran, this part 12, brought to you with the support of Yazdani Law Group, one of Canada's largest immigration law firms, YLGPC, 
on Instagram. Please check out our regular editions of Rook and all things related at rookmedia.com. Our website to become a sponsor of the Contemporary History of Iran. You can find us at our website, rookmedia.com, or email us at info at rookmedia.com. Thanks to the team who make Rook Media happen. Susan, Anahita, Parisot, Ponta, Keon, Roham, Mehrdad, Reza, and Shaya. Thank you to all of you out there supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you've not done so already. Find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. Mizun Bashin.